Okay, so let's uh, continue with the epistemic part, with the second level. And you see here uh, also I have a kind of uh, substructure. I will first uh, briefly introduce again this key distinction between aleatoric epistemic uncertainty and then um, give an overview of uh, two, I would say, uh, currently the main approaches to tackling the question of how to represent epistemic uncertainty in a machine learning uh, setting, and finally make a few remarks on this quantification problem. You remember in the beginning I said we do make this distinction between representation and quantification of uncertainty. Okay, so uh, if you reconsider what uh, first Victor and then Willem have been speaking about, um, Basically, what Willem considered in the end is uh, the situation like here. So this is an example, a graphical illustration of a three-class classification problem. So suppose we, uh, we, we, we are in a classification setting. We have three possible outcomes. Could be, for example, win, loss, or tie of a football match. You want to predict uh, the outcome of a football match. Um, and uh, we can represent the probabilities here as points in this uh, barycentric coordinate system. This is a projection of the two simplex that you have already seen before. So every point here corresponds to a um, probability distribution, probability assigned to one of the three classes. Our assumption is that the ground truth, there is a ground truth uh, probability. So in this sense, Referring back to what uh, Victor has also speaking about, we are we take a frequentist position here. Common assumption in a machine learning world: there is a ground truth conditional probability of the outcomes given our current x. And um, we also assumed uh, as a basic primitive so far a probabilistic predictor which predicts this ground truth probability. Yeah? Ah, sorry, the, 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 the green one is the ground truth. And the red one is the predicted probability. And of course, we will never exactly hit uh, the ground truth green probability distribution here. We are always a little bit off. This first level predictor, this probabilistic predictor, is all the more better, is all the more uncertainty aware then a deterministic predictor, which just predicts a class, which means one of the corner points. Yeah? So that's already not so bad. And uh, this problem of calibration that Willem has been speaking about is mainly about the question, how do I bring the red point closer to the green point? How do I improve my probability predictions? That's one way, let's say, to make the, the learner more uncertainty aware. However, as long as we are here, as we remain on the first level and we force our predictor to give us a precise probability distribution, we basically do not allow the learner to express its uncertainty about this prediction. By giving just a single point, a precise probability distribution, the learner pretends, or actually it has to pretend, full certainty about this prediction. So 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, that's my guess. But no chance to express any sort of uncertainty about this prediction. If we want the learner um, to be able to express uncertainty about the prediction, to express epistemic uncertainty, epistemic meaning referring to the state of knowledge of the learner, its epistemic state. We have to be more expressive in a sense. And this is what you see here on the right. This is what we call a second order predictor, where the prediction is not just the probability distribution or a probability vector, like in this example, but something more expressive, like, for example, a set of probability distributions, a set of probability distributions. This is what is called a creedal set in the literature. 
or maybe a second order distribution, a distribution over distribution. Yeah? And this allows the learner to uh, represent uncertainty, epistemic uncertainty. So for example, if the learner does not know anything, so I ask you for the outcome of a football match and you do not even know the teams uh, because they are from, I don't know, from, from the Netherlands. <laughs> Um, the, the German main competitor in football, um, then you could give the whole, uh, let's say, the whole simplex. You say, I don't know anything. Yeah, I do not even know the teams. But if I ask you, for example, um, about uh, the outcome of your favorite football team, yeah, um, your favorite football team, and you know your team and also the competitors and so on, you might be able to give a much more precise uh, prediction. The important point now, and this is also a key distinction between aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty, is that this uncertainty on the right-hand side, this second-order uncertainty, is reducible. You could collect more information, even about uh, Netherlands football teams, <laughs> if you want, and then maybe uh, when, once you are more informed, you could give a better prediction. You can, you can reduce your uncertainty. And this is a key distinction we make. Um, aleatoric uncertainty is, is uncertainty you cannot get rid of. Epistemic uncertainty is uncertainty that is, in principle, reducible. So here is, again, a summary um, of the main characteristics of these two types of uncertainty. Aleatoric uncertainty refers to the notion of randomness, uh, meaning inherent variability in the outcome, which is due to random effects, inherently random effects. So this is the property of the data generating process. It's a property of the data, not of the learner. And as such, it is uh, re irreducible. Epistemic uncertainty on the other side refers to uncertainty caused by a lack of knowledge and the epistemic state of the agent. So this is a property of the learning algorithm, not of the data. And as such, it can be reduced on the basis of additional information. Typically, the information we can acquire in addition in a machine learning scenario is more data. That's one way, but the, you could also think of other additional information sources. So you may add, for example, also more features yeah, to your feature description of instances or whatever sort of information you can think of might also be additional domain knowledge, background information, yeah, that could also be helpful to reduce uncertainty. This example I have already shown in the beginning, just to repeat, so here's a typical example, binary classification, in the one case, uncertainty more of aleatoric nature, on the other side, more of epistemic nature and this dependency on the prior assumptions you start with, I also already mentioned before. One additional remark I would like to make here is that uh, in order to be able to represent and quantify uncertainty in a meaningful way, you have to start from some concrete assumptions that you do not call into question. Otherwise, it's impossible to give any guarantees. It's like guarantees you also know for generalization performance. In machine learning, they are always conditional to some assumptions. For example, my data is IID or whatever. Um, here is an, is, is, is an example which uh, tries to illustrate that. Uh, imagine, again, we have seen two classes so far positive, negative, and now we want to make a prediction for this class here. Under the common assumption that uh, we are in a closed world, the problem is binary, and in our world, there are only these two classes, you will probably be quite certain that this is a positive point, red. Not necessarily the most typical red, but red, yeah? However, if you give up this assumption that we are in a closed world and uh, you allow for the possibility that additional classes may occur over the 
over time, this is the OOD setting, this data point might be OOD, then you are no longer that sure. It could be a red point, but it could be also a third class that you have never seen before, that you have never seen before, yeah? Then uncertainty increases. And this again shows, depending on what assumption you start from, you will be more or less uncertain. I think this is very important because um, if you look at the current literature, it's not always clear what assumptions are made and uh, on what basis uncertainty is quantified. In particular, if you look at the papers on this OOD scenario, very often some quantities are computed uh, supposed to reflect uncertainty, but it's not really clear under what assumptions these things are are done. So assumptions are uh, important. We are uh, mostly interested, um, I said before, and Willem also made that very clear, I think, in predictive uncertainty. So uh, we uh, suppose that we have a learner age uh, or a predictor age, which given a query instance X delivers a prediction. And what we would like now, this is what I explained before, uh, we would like to make our learner more expressive so that it can give us as a prediction some capital Q here, which uh, might be a probability distribution, but which might also be something, something more expressive, um, something that allows the learner to uh, represent its epistemic uncertainty in a faithful uh, manner. Um, if you look into the literature in the last couple of years, uh, various proposals have been made how to um, predict uh, such uh, cues and how to use them to represent uncertainty. Um, my categorization here is into, into three main uh, categories. The, base, the, the standard Bayesian approach, which basically we all know very well and uh, if you speak to a dogmatic Bayesian, we had this discussion also with dogmatic Bayesian reviewers and so on, they will tell you all you need is Bayesian theory. So we, we did that already. We did already everything. So why, don't, why do you care at all? It's true to some extent. I mean, the Bayesian approach is one way to go, but there are also good reasons to look for alternatives. One interesting alternative, um, is what is uh, nowadays subsumed under this notion of direct uncertainty prediction. I will also speak a little bit um, about this. And uh, then there is also a category which has no specific name. I called it validation and self-assessment here. This is basically the idea. Do I have a slide on this? Uh, I don't remember whether I have a slide on this, but this is basically the idea that uh, you have a learner which uh, first predains, uh, trains a predictive model and then somehow assesses or evaluates the predictive model itself in a kind of validation step. Um, conformal prediction, which uh, Willem has been speaking about, is maybe a good example. Um, the conformal uh, predictor, I mean, it first learns a predictive model and then somehow validates or calibrates that model and comes up with the uh, conclusions like, if my, uh, let's say, um, predicted, uh, or let's say the, the predicted probability of the true class with a very high probability is not lower than, let's say, 0.3, which then allows it to exclude all, uh, predict, uh, all classes which have a predicted probability um, lower than 0.3 without making mistakes in most of the cases. Um, I won't go into detail here because that is already partly covered by Willem. So let us first look at the standard Bayesian approach. Uh, in the very beginning, Victor already introduced the standard Bayesian uh, theory, um, Bayesian inference, and this is in a sense an application of Bayesian inference here. So. In the Bayesian approach to machine learning, you know the learner does not learn a single predictor. So this is our hypothesis phase. Every point in this space is a 
predictor, a model, predictive model, but maintains a distribution over the hypothesis space. And uh, given a set of observed training data, it turns the prior into a posterior. This is this P of H given D here. And then having to make a prediction for a query instance X, this um, posterior on the model space translates into a posterior on the prediction space, um, this uh, P hat here. And uh, this is uh, what is called the posterior predictive distribution. And this is in a sense exactly what we want if the individual predictors are probabilistic predictors, then this is a second order distribution. So take the case of binary classification as an example. This is what is illustrated here. Um, P is the ground truth conditional probability of the positive class given X. Yeah. And uh, what uh, the Bayesian approach delivers us here, the posterior predictive distribution is a distribution over over the possible ground truth probabilities. Every probability is assigned a degree of probability density. Mm. So what, what is now ref reflecting the epistemic uncertainty? There is a question. Yeah. Dimension in order to include all possible assumption sets. Yes, yes, you can uh, you can uh, increase your hypothesis space. The basic assumption that is made here is that the ground truth um the ground truth predictor is an element of your hypothesis space. Uh, otherwise, you have something that is called model misspecification. Then you have a severe problem. Um, I think I will shortly come back to this in the end, because then uh, all these uncertainty quantification things really break down and lead to more or less meaningful statements. Um, this is a, one assumption you make, uh, you have to make. Uh, I think then everything is fine. Another assumption, and uh, this will also be discussed a little bit later on, is of course uh, the choice of the prior, which is always a key problem in the Bayesian approach. And this is subjective to some extent. I mean, there is this is a kind of implicit assumption to be made by the learner. And this has to do with a problem, but again, I will come back to this, um, that uh, the quantification of epistemic uncertainty is really a problem which does not, this is at least uh, the uh, opinion that we currently have, does not have a really objective solution. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so, so what is now reflecting the epistemic uncertainty of the learner? It's the width, the, 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 the spread of this distribution. If this distribution here is very peak, then it seems the learner is very sure about the ground truth probability. If it's, if it's widely spread, then it, the learner seems to be less certain because some of the models, I mean, the, the models here, the different predictors uh, are not very coherent. Now they suggest different probabilities. Okay, and then um, this is, so to say, the, the, the first level, the aleatoric level. This is the second level, the epistemic level. And then if you want, we have a zero level, ground zero, uh, with uh, the outcome we observe, positive, negative. So the Bayesian approach, uh, of course, is difficult to uh, implement in practice, simply because if you imagine that you have a complicated um, high dimensional uh, hypothesis space, uh, every predictor here could be a neural network. Yeah? How do you maintain a distribution over a space of neural networks and so on? Uh, the inference here is then uh, very costly, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a, clearly a computational problem with the Bayesian approach, even if some advances have been made in the last years. 
Uh, therefore, what is currently quite popular is to uh, go for ensemble methods and uh, interpret this ensemble. So you train a set of finite set of models um, here and uh, then obtain a histogram from the predictions made by the individual models. You obtain a histogram instead of a continuous distribution and you interpret this as an approximation of the distribution. Yeah, that's currently quite popular. Mm, there are these ensembles of deep neural networks that are commonly used, etc. An interesting question is how good that approximation is. Um, the literature is not very well developed on this as far as I know. Maybe somebody knows more, but um, what can you say about the quality of the approximation of um, the ground truth posterior distribution, yeah. predicted posterior? Okay, I just wanted to mention that there is a natural frequentist counterpart to this Bayesian approach here, um, which is uh, based on the use of Fisher information also introduced by Victor. Yeah. Committee, yeah. Level one. On the level one, uh, yeah, maybe I forgot uh, to say that um, if you want to have a point prediction, what do you do? Uh, again, uh, Victor already introduced this uh, in the beginning. You do model averaging. Yeah, so here, uh, the P, uh, the P head, sorry, the P head is just the expectation of that distribution. This is uh, what you do in classical Bayesian inference. You do model averaging. That's how you get your single P if you want a single P. Sometimes you need a single P, but uh, the big advantage of the Bayesian approach from the epistemic perspective is that it does not only give us a single P head, but it gives us in addition this distribution. And this distribution is telling us something about the epistemic state of the learner. Is the learner very sure about the P head because the distribution is very peaked? Or is uh, the learner not very sure? And uh, we got the p-head just by averaging uh, a, a distribution that is relatively widespread. Yeah? Uh, I was, uh, thank you. Um, for the ensembling, I was wondering, um, do we just need to initialize different neural networks with different um, parameters in the beginning? Or should we have different classes of mm predictors to have a better mm. spread of? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, actually, uh, you, you will find diverse, uh, very different proposals in the literature. This ensemble of deep neural networks, for example, they are based on reinitialization. You initialize um, the neural networks in different ways, and then you apply them to the same learning, but uh, to the same uh, training data. Uh, but there is also this idea of uh, bagging, yeah, bootstrapping, and so on, resampling techniques. Uh, you can think of many things. The point I wanted to make also with my remark is that this is all a bit, uh, let's say, heuristic. And uh, the claim that your distribution here approximates well the true posterior, uh, I don't know. I mean, I didn't, I don't, I'm not aware of a good theoretical foundation of that so far. That's what I wanted to say. So there is no. And is there a ground truth true posterior or is it all subjective? Bias, I mean, by assumption, yes, there is. Um, what is subjective is the prior you start with. And uh, the posterior, of course, depends on the prior. Yeah. But once you fix your prior, there is a ground truth posterior. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, the, the advantage, once again, of the Bayesian approach is that it gives us this second order distribution. The standard frequentist approach does not give us uh, such a distribution in the first place. Again, Victor explained this in the beginning. Uh, the standard way to go for the frequentist is to a point estimation. If you want to have such information about how certain or uncertain is my learner, my predictor, about its prediction, 
uh, you can use something like Fisher information, again, introduced by Victor. Um, in the beginning, and this is also done in machine learning, uh, there is this idea of Laplace approximation and so on, where you actually do a point estimation or you train a single predictor, for example, by maximum likelihood estimation, and then making use of Fisher information, you construct around the point prediction, a kind of confidence region uh, or a distribution, a Gaussian distribution, telling you something about how certain or uncertain is that prediction. Yeah, so there is also a frequentist counterpart to the Bayesian approach. Okay, so um, now, as I said, this Bayesian approach uh, is uh, theoretically very well grounded, uh, computationally mm, not always feasible. So we may think of uh, another approach. In particular, we may think of doing more direct uncertainty estimation, uh, somehow circumventing this indirect approach via uh, the use of uh, prior and a posterior distribution. So you know, in the Bayesian approach, we always have to specify the prior distribution and there are big debates about how to do that. And uh, if you specify a prior in a certain way, then it's always subjective and so on and so on. So the Bayesian approach is very much criticized also for the specification of a prior. So the question is, can we do it maybe um, without the need for such a prior in a more direct way? And what has been proposed here in the literature is uh, what is called direct, uh, direct um, um, uncertain, uh, how is it called? Direct uncertainty prediction. Direct uncertainty prediction. Uh, this is not, by the way, not an official term, but it's often used in the literature. Um, and uh, here um, on the left, you see a sketch of the idea when you use a neural network, for example, you could think of training a neural network, which takes a query instance as an input, uh, like an X-ray image in our example in the beginning, and then produces as a prediction here in the output layer, not a probability degree for positive negative, so not a point on the ale aleatoric level, but a distribution on the epistemic level, a distribution on the epistemic level, a second order distribution. Since predicting a complete distribution might not be so easy, um, it's better, uh, of course, it's more convenient to use a parametric family, a parametrized family of second order distributions and then predict the parameters of the distribution. In this example, the second order, fa the, the family here is the Dirichlet distribution, which is commonly used um, for classification problems because of the reasons already mentioned by Victor in the beginning. And um, the Dirichlet distribution in the binary case is um, parametrized by two parameters, alpha one and alpha two. And uh, for alpha one, alpha two equal one, you obtain the uniform distribution the higher the two values are for alpha one, alpha two, the more peaked the distribution becomes. And uh, by making them different, like here 312, you can skew your distribution to the one side or uh, the other side. So the learner by playing with the alpha one and alpha two is now able to express more, let's say confidence in positive, more confidence in negative, but also more or less epistemic uncertainty. It can make the distribution more peaked or less peaked. Yeah. So in principle, if you would be able to train a neural network delivering these two parameters as a prediction, you would exactly have what you want, a second order prediction from which then again, by model averaging, you can again, if you want, if you need, um, derive a first order prediction. Okay, but how do you do that? I mean, how do you how do you train such a second order predictor, such a second order predictor? Yeah? How do you do that? 
So what we want, let us formalize, let us formalize the problem a little bit. What we want is a, a predictor, H hat called H hat here, which takes uh, which which um, which we train on standard training data because, of course, we do not have second order training information. We just have X Y training information as we normally have. So, for example, an instance, an X Y image together with an outcome, positive, negative. So, uh, what we want is to train a predictor which is a mapping from instances to second order probabilities, namely probabilities of probabilities of outcomes. Now, second order probability like Dirichlet. Not necessarily, but is, is an example, Dirichlet. And we um, denote this class here by P2. P2 of Y is the set of probability distributions over probability distributions uh, of Y. So, um, the first idea, of course, uh, for every machine learner is to go the standard way and do empirical risk minimization. So uh, if we had a loss function L2, which compares a, such a second order prediction, H of Xi, with an observed outcome, Yi, then we could do empirical risk minimization. We could just find the predictor uh, which minimizes our second order loss L2 on the training data. Uh, th that is the most obvious way to go for a machine learner. But what we need uh, for this is of course a second order loss function uh, L2, which takes as input a second order prediction and a zero order outcome obs observation and penalizes the second order distribution in light of the observed outcome, positive, negative, for example. Okay, and uh, so the, the, the main question now is, can we come up with a meaningful second order loss so that if you do empirical risk minimization, uh, the predictor somehow represents its uh, epistemic uncertainty in a faithful way, whatever that means. Um, why is there at least a hope that this approach can work? There is at least a hope because it does work for first order predictions. Again, Victor, I'm very much referring to Victor. This is a good introduction, Victor. Uh, so he raised already many important concepts. Um, for, the, for the first order approach, it does work when uh, you are losing, when you are using, not losing, when you are using uh, as a loss function, a proper scoring rule, yeah, a proper, uh, a proper scoring rule, because we know that um, if our loss function is a proper score, like Breyer score or log loss, then um, if the learner wants to minimize the loss in expectation, it must predict the ground truth probability. The ground truth probability minimizes the score in expectation. So in other words, the, the loss function, the proper scoring rule, provides exactly the right incentive to the learner to predict the true probabilities. Exactly the right incentive to the learner. Yeah? So, and this is, uh, by the way, also, of course, the reason why uh, Cross entropy and these things are commonly used when you train standard neural networks. They work well. And also in logistic regression, these loss functions are used and so on. So if you want to have well calibrated probabilities, this is the right way to go. Yeah? So here's uh, summarized what I just said. If you do empirical risk minimization with a loss function L1, with that compares a predicted probability with a ground truth outcome with a label, um, and the loss is a proper scoring rule, then you are exactly doing the right thing, and uh, your predictor is incentivized to predict the ground truth probability. Uh, this is uh, just uh, repeating uh, what uh, how these proper uh, scoring rules um, are defined, but uh, this definition has already given by 
uh, by, by Victor. And here are again examples of uh, proper scoring rules, uh, the Breyer score, uh, and the cross entropy, which are both commonly used in multi class classification. Okay, so now coming back uh, to our second order problem, how can we come up uh, with now with the second order loss, which um, delivers actually what we want? Several authors in the literature proposed a second order loss function which is defined in this way. It is based on an, it takes an L1 loss and lifts it, so to say, uh, to the second level in the following way. Um, L2 of uh, capital QY is defined as the expectation of L1 PY where the P, the probability distribution, is uh, sampled according, is distributed according to the capital Q. Yeah, so in other words, um, you can think of a um, random process where um, given the capital Q, you randomly sample a level one distribution from the Q and then give this as a prediction. And then the learner is penalized by the standard L1 loss, which compares that prediction with the true outcome. For example, uh, the P, uh, for example, in terms of uh, a log loss, L1 could be the log loss. Huh? This at first sight looks like a meaningful definition. And uh, you can, of course, you know, uh, you all know that doing empirical risk minimization is often not exactly what you should do because of overfitting issues and so on. And that's why um, also here, a regularized version of uh, this loss function has been proposed. Uh, this part here is exactly that part, but then you add uh, additionally um, a term which uh, penalizes the deviation of your prediction capital Q from a reference distribution Q0 in terms of KL divergence. And the Q0 is typically taken as the uniform distribution. So in other words, the learner here is incentivized to keep close to the uniform distribution. Yeah, I will come back to this later. Um, so now, um, we have been, this is uh, mostly also now um, our own work uh, that we have recently been doing. Um, we have uh, looked at this approach a bit more closely also from a theoretical perspective. And if you want to uh, analyze it and uh, see whether it's doing really what it's supposed to do, then uh, you have to first of all make clear what do we mean by um, representing epistemic uncertainty in a faithful way? What, what does that mean? Um, the problem, of course, with epistemic uncertainty is, first of all, that unlike the first level uncertainty, where we assume there is a ground truth, even if we don't know it, but at least there is a good reason to say there is a ground truth probability given x, um, for the uh, second level, for the epistemic level, this is much less clear. Um, it's hard to argue there is a ground truth objective second order or epistemic uncertainty representation. Uh, so there is, there is actually no really ground truth. So what, what do we actually expect? What do we want? Uh, what would we call a faithful representation? Informally, we call a second order loss L2 appropriate if the following holds. And here, uh, for simplicity, the X is omitted. Uh, this is so to say, when the learner makes predictions in a single point. So um, let's uh, say uh, Q capital N uh, is the second order representation that the learner uh, obtains by minimizing the second order loss L2 on a sequence of outcomes it observes, so positive, negative in the binary case. Then at least what we would expect is that uh, are these two, uh, pro uh, these two uh, properties here. Uh, what we would expect, first of all, is that 
um, the learner's uncertainty gradually decreases, gets smaller, at least an expectation, with an increasing sample size, capital N, uh, where the uncertainty is measured in terms of a meaningful uncertainty measure, capital U, so Shannon entropy or so, for example. And second, uh, when the N goes to infinity, then all epistemic uncertainty disappears, which means that the second order representation here converges to a Dirac distribution, which puts all probability mass on a single point, on a single probability distribution. Because in the limit, when the learner has seen infinitely many data, all epistemic uncertainty disappears because then it knows all it can know about the data generating process. So graphically, I have shown this here. Suppose that uh, the green point here is our ground truth probability. Then we suppose that in the beginning, the learner has a high epistemic uncertainty, representing this, for example, in terms of uh, the uniform distribution. But then when it observes more and more data, um, the distribution gets more and more peaked suggesting that the learner gets more and more confident. And in the limit, it converges toward uh, the Dirac function here, which puts all probability mass on the ground truth probability. These are at least uh, two qualitative properties that we would expect. Um, yeah. And what we have uh, shown, this is work we have done together, the three of us, um, is that a second order loss function, like the one I introduced before, which has been proposed in the literature, take the expectation over an L1 loss and maybe regularize it, that a second order loss of this kind is not an appropriate loss function in the sense just defined. It delivers not this minimal requirement that we would expect uh, such a loss function to, to guarantee, yeah? So this result is uh, general in the sense that the Q can be any second order distribution. So it's not restricted to Dirichlet distribution, can be any second order distribution. And also the assumption on this uh, uncertainty measure that we use to quantify uncertainty is relatively minimal. So it's a relatively general uh, result. So, and what this result shows is that the quality of a second order prediction Q cannot be judged uh, only in the context of ground truth, let's say level zero observation. So this makes this makes one key problem very clear, namely that we are missing training information on the first level. We do not observe ground truth first order distributions. We only observe ground truth um, labels on level zero. Yeah, and um, therefore intuitively. Um, it's uh, also somehow intuitively the problem should be clear. So for instance, um, you cannot, if you observe on level zero, let's say half of the time positive, half of the time negative, you cannot distinguish two scenarios where um, the level, uh, level one distribution is peak at one half. So you always flip a fair coin. This is perfectly coherent with your observation that half of the cases are positive, half of the cases are negative. You always flip a fair coin. So the probability is one half uh, with probability one, or we have the uniform distribution where we first randomly pick a biased coin with any bias between zero and one, and then flip to obtain an outcome. In both cases, you will observe on the level zero, the same sequence of zeros and ones, positives and negatives. You can't distinguish. And the, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you can't really distinguish. And, and this is somehow on the basis of this impossibility result. We have even generalized this a little bit and um, came up with, a, with an extension of this notion of a proper scoring rule, we recently in a paper introduced the notion of a proper second order scoring rule, which follows the same principle, the same idea, 
Um, and uh, I don't explain this now in all detail, but which basically says that um, this, uh, what we expect is that the second order scoring, the second order score S2 um, is minimal here if, um, as a prediction, you plug in the ground truth second order distribution. Yeah, S2 of QQ is smaller equal S2 of Q hat Q for every Q hat and Q. Um, intuitively, this means that if the learner holds a second order belief capital Q, if it believes capital Q on the epistemic level, then in order to minimize the loss in expectation, the best it can do is to also report the Q, its own belief. If that is not the case, it might be that although the learner believes Q, it's better in terms of penalization by the loss function to say something else. And indeed, uh, these loss functions that we, for these loss functions that we have seen before, basically mathematically it's because of their convexity, even if the learner knows nothing and should actually report the uniform distribution on the uh, unit interval for the bias of the coin, for example, even in that situation, it's better for the learner to say, I am certain this is a one-half, one-half probability. So Dirac at one-half. Because then in expectation, it's penalized less by these distributions. Huh? So um, this is, of course, uh, actually desirable. This is what we want. If the learner holds the second order belief Q and is penalized according to L2, L2 uh, then it should actually report this Q as a prediction Q hat. But what we could show is there is Essentially, no, uh, Victor, correct me. There is still a small gap. Did we fill it meanwhile? No, uh, there is a tiny gap, uh, but <laughs> there, there is essentially, there is essentially no second order loss L2, uh, which is a proper second order scoring rule. So it doesn't exist. There is no such loss function. And we are quite, we are quite optimistic that we can even fill this tiny gap but there is essentially no loss function of that type. So um, what this is telling us is that um, this approach actually cannot work, at least not theoretically. Nevertheless, uh, it has been tried in the literature and also some good empirical results have been reported. Um, the thing is that and I'm coming back now to this regular riser here. Um, if you add this regular riser, then, as I said, the learner is incentivized to keep close to the reference distribution Q0 here. So this Q0 influences, strongly influences the epistemic uncertainty that the learner is reporting. So for this particular case, I have uh, shown you this expectation over L1 losses, as I said, Due to the convexity of the L1 loss, the best for the learner is to predict a Dirac distribution. So the learner, by doing empirical risk minimization, it would pretend to be totally certain about the predicted probability. However, if you add this regular riser here, it finds a compromise yeah, between the Dirac and the uniform. It delivers a second order distribution, which is not a Dirac, but which contains some or reflects uh, some degree of epistemic uncertainty. But it all depends on what reference distribution you put here and uh, on your regularization parameter. So it means that you somehow impose the uh, epistemic uncertainty represented by the learner from external, somehow externally. And this is, of course, actually not really what you want. So from this point of view, uh, we can certainly call this uh, approach into question. On the other side, we also have to admit that um, quantifying epistemic uncertainty somehow is really a hard problem 
due to its non-objective nature, as I said before, and it and also we cannot really expect that we that we can uh, train a model representing its epistemic uncertainty only on the basis of the data because without being biased in any way. Also the Bayesian approach, in the Bayesian approach, the um, epistemic uncertainty of the learner in its predictions depends on the prior. With the prior, you also control um, whether your learner is more uh, epistemically uncertain or less. So in a sense, it seems you cannot really avoid imposing this epistemic uncertainty in one way or the other from the outside. Yeah? No, what I mean is really depend on the data. But uh, the point I want to make is that uh, your epistemic uncertainty, and that's also um, coherent with what I said in the beginning when you remember my example, what I want to say is here that the epistemic uncertainty always depends on the data and the prior assumptions you start with. Uh, the learning bias, for example, the representation bias, whether you assume a linear dependency, a highly nonlinear dependency, and so on. In the Bayesian approach, this prior knowledge is very explicitly represented by the prior distribution. So here it's really made very precise. If you already start with a very peak prior, you end up with a peak distribution. Yeah. If you start with a more flat prior, you end up with a more flat distribution. Predict yeah, yeah, in, in the limit, I mean, the limit case is a slightly different thing. In the limit, I do agree, the Bayesian approach converges to a Dirac distribution. So this is actually what we want. And the Bayesian approach, by the way, is more coherent with um, our requirements uh, in the um, in in the limit. Yes, um, this is exactly what happens. Uh, and in the limit, the limit is also, by the way, not the problem of uh, this approach here. The limit is not uh, not the problem of this approach. Uh, it, the problem of this approach is that this full certainty is also is already pretended in the very beginning. That's actually the problem. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, and this somehow is also understandable if you compare to the Bayesian approach where you also need this external, let's say, um, information uh, in the form of a prior distribution. Okay, um, so do I still have time or? Okay, yeah, just I need uh, just five minutes uh, more, then we can even stop a bit earlier or have some time for, for questions. Uh, this uncertainty quantification part, um, I, I, uh, I, I just wanted to, uh, to briefly introduce you to the problem uh, because we don't have the time to discuss this here in detail. But what we mean by uncertainty quantification is actually to um, to take a representation. So it's supposed the learner predicts a second order distribution uh, or a set of distributions and uh, put a number on that distribution um, quantifying how uncertain the learner is. You all know Shannon entropy. Yeah, this is a classical measure of uncertainty contained in a probability distribution. Um, and uh, when you have such a quant, Having such a quantity is often very useful because you can say in this situation, the learner is more uncertain in that situation less, or uh, if I take this and that measure, then I'm able to reduce uncertainty yeah, in decision tree learning, for example, in active learning. In all these scenarios, it's very useful to have a quantitative measure of uh, uncertainty. Um, now, the interesting question, is if we go from level one to level two, if we work with uh, second order distributions, um, how can we measure the total uncertainty 
contained in such a queue. So for example, a distribution of distributions, a second order distribution, um, or a set of distributions, a creedal set. How can we measure quantitatively um, the amount of uncertainty uh, represented here? And can we even, and this is a problem that has been studied uh, quite intensively in the literature, can we uh, perhaps even decompose this total uncertainty into two parts in an additive way, namely aleatoric uncertainty and epistemic uncertainty, such that the sum of the two is the total uncertainty. Then you would know what is the total amount of uncertainty of my learner in the current prediction, plus what part of that uncertainty is due to aleatoric nature of the data, and what part is due to lack of knowledge. That would be nice, yeah? But again, it's not so easy. Um, here I give you a simple example trying to illustrate why making this distinction is not so easy. So you all know from school, yeah, I give <clears throat> you are given a short sequence of numbers and you have to predict the next one. Uh, so if I say two, four, six, yeah, Willem will say eight. <laughs> Victor also. Um, that's easy. Uh, so here is a slightly more complicated sequence. Uh, so uh, who 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 has a clue? What is the next number? Some genius here in the audience. So, so what? <laughs> Good. Are you a computer scientist? Mm -hmm. So um, it's hard to say, and of course you are all highly uncertain. Now. The point, the actual point is, um, you are uncertain, that's clear, but is your uncertainty of epistemic nature or is it of aleatoric nature? Can you tell? Can you say? Hard to say, right? Simply because, simply because you are totally epistemically uncertain and you do not know whether perhaps the uncertainty is indeed aleatoric, this sequence could be a sequence of random numbers. And in this case, all uncertainty would be aleatoric. But it could also be, and by the way, that's how it is in this example, uh, that there is a deterministic, uh, <laughs> there is a deterministic rule behind. And if you had enough training data, you could learn it. And then all uncertainty would be gone and you could deterministically predict the next number. Um, which means that in this case, uh, all uncertainty is of epistemic nature. But here you cannot really say, and what this example shows is that epistemic uncertainty actually implies uncertainty about the data generating process and therefore um, about the ground truth aleatoric uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And this uh, somehow... Uh, yeah, also means that precise quantification of aleatoric uncertainty is actually not really possible unless the epistemic uncertainty is completely disappeared. And, um, okay, I skipped this because now it's already late and we don't want to have, yeah? Yeah. No, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, on this slide, I just uh, summarized one of the currently uh, common approaches to quantify uh, these types of uncertainty for uh, second order probability distributions, which is uh, measuring total uncertainty in terms of Shannon entropy of the marginal distribution on the outcome. Um, aleatoric uncertainty in terms of conditional entropy and, um, and, and, um, epistemic uncertainty in terms of mutual information. This goes back to, uh, to an equation that is known from information theory, namely that um, Shannon entropy additively decomposes into conditional entropy and mutual information. Yeah, this is an equation that holds, provably, information theory. Uh, the question is um, whether this is really a good way of measuring these different types of uncertainty, and we have recently uh, shown in a paper or argued in a paper that this is not necessarily the case, um, simply because uh, in some scenarios, yeah, these measures do not exactly deliver what we 
expect. So, for example, the maximum uh, epistemic uncertainty is not obtained for the uniform distribution, but for this distribution here, which is a mixture of two Dirac distributions and so on. So, uh, again, in the interest of time, I don't go into detail here. If you are interested, we can speak about later, or you can have a look at the paper. Um, and, um, yeah, so... Um, this uh, is my last figure here, and it's somehow making uh, also the point that this additive decomposition is something that you may question. Uh, can we additively decompose uh, total uncertainty into these two parts? And um, the point is that, uh, so what, what you see here is, um, if, our, if, if our training data is empty, so we are in the very beginning, then, of course, we would expect the uncertainty to be the highest. Let's say normalized value of one, the total uncertainty. And it uh, gets smaller if we observe more training data. But in the beginning, actually, the epistemic uncertainty should also be arguably the, have the highest value because you don't, don't know anything, so you are fully epistemically uncertain. The aleatoric uncertainty actually is constant, because this is a property of the data, has nothing to do with learning, the true aleatoric uncertainty. But if you assume an additive decomposition of total into epistemic, then it means that uh, aleatoric is the difference, total minus epistemic, and this is this dotted green line here, which is not uh, the, 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 the solid green line, as you can see. And uh, this shows that, at best, if you do this additive decomposition, at best, this uh, aleatoric uncertainty can be interpreted as a lower bound on the true aleatoric uncertainty. Yeah? So the message is, you should be careful with this additive uh, decomposition. Okay, I skip this and summarize. Um, so what we have seen is, or I, I hope at least this me message came across, that learning reliable predictors uh, that represent their uncertainty in a faithful way is an important task, but uh, very challenging both conceptually and computationally. And indeed, there are still many things uh, open conceptually. Distinguishing different types of uncertainty, notably aleatoric and epistemic, is very useful. Uh, but it seems that especially this uh, second order uncertainty, this epistemic uncertainty is really hard to capture, how to represent that in a really proper way. Um, quantifying predictive uncertainty in a theoretically sound manner and uh, disentangling it into aleatoric and epistemic parts, this quantification problem is also problematic yeah, I couldn't go into detail here, but again, the proposals that have been made currently in the literature are not arguably, arguably not uh, perfect, at least can be criticized. So you see, there are still many open questions, which uh, also makes, of course, the field interesting. So there is still lots of work to do. And besides what we tackled here, what we mentioned here, there are various other open problems, so what happens, for example, um, if you have model uncertainty, there are, we had this uh, short discussion about model misspecification, it's not uh, very clear. Generalized settings uh, like OOD data, where we give up this IID assumption, how do, you <clears throat> how do you deal with this in a theoretically sound way? The question of how to practically evaluate uh, such predictors, which deliver, for example, second order predictions, is not so easy, um, yeah, uh, because you don't observe uh, first order uh, data and so on, and other forms, uh, how to capture other forms of uncertainty, how to, um, how to incorporate these methods in applications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah, many open questions, but uh, at least uh, I hope we could give you. And a good introduction into the topic, and uh, we are now almost in the end, but do still have time for a couple of questions, if you have any. Yes, there is one. So, um, 
my question is about this distinction between aleatoric and epistemic uh, uncertainty. So I totally get you uh, what you said about the level zero, uh, zero, one, and two. Yeah. No questions asked there. Mm -hmm. So I kind of mean something different, which is that um, these levels are kind of conceptually like ma mathematical. This distinction between aleatoric and epistemic, you map this like one to one to these levels in a way you call it each like those levels epistemic and aleatoric but i don't quite i have a little bit i don't quite get that because um let's assume you have no epistemic uncertainty right and you do a coin toss so except for like quantum mechanical uh things um i would i would assume that this whole thing what what is happening is totally uh deterministic except for quantum mechanics except but I can't claim to under, under, have yeah, yeah. understood that. Mm. So, um, so I would assume that if I have no epistemic uncertainty, um, I don't really see where aleatoric uncertainty mm. really exists. Mm. Um, I'm also excluding free will, of course, um, because that's a whole different topic. So I see like three sources of how something comes to be, like a deterministic part, uh, mm. a, a true aleatoric random process, which is except for quantum mechanics questionable sort of and free will but we leave that aside too so i don't really see where there is real mm. tangible aleatoric uncertainty yeah yeah very good point uh, <clears throat> and um, a very legitimate uh, question indeed and uh, if you uh, look into the philosophical literature and so on uh, there is a big debate about whether for example there are different types of uncertainty whether there exists aleatoric uncertainty at all. Some people take this um, position of determinism, basically saying that if we would have infinite uh, compute capacities, we could basically compute everything deterministically and there would be no aleatoric uncertainty uh, left. Yeah. So the position we take here, and uh, I, I'm totally fine with this discussion and I also find it interesting. Um, we are here a little bit more pragmatic and refer to this notion of reducibility. So uh, for us, pragmatically, uh, all uncertainty that can in principle be reduced due to collecting additional information is captured under the notion of epistemic, the rest under the notion of aleatoric. Now you may ask the question, what is reducible versus irreducible? And uh, again, it depends on uh, your current, uh, let's say, setting and application. Uh, you might be in an application where the only additional information you may uh, collect is more data. Then the only source of reducibility is data. You might also be in a situation where you cannot just collect more data, but you could also add more features to your instance description. You can enlarge the dimensionality of your instance case. And this has an important impact because you may uh, have data distributions which in a low dimensional space highly overlap, meaning the aleatoric uncertainty in a certain region is high. Once you embed them in a higher dimensional space, um, aleatoric uncertainty disappears because the two distributions are well separated. And yes, um, um, this is exactly what we mean by reducibility. If you have the possibility to reduce uncertainty by adding new features, then you can, uh, yeah, then in a sense, uh, you can get rid of certain uncertainty. Um, and this shows that our, at least our understanding of this notions of aleatoric uncertainty and epistemic uncertainty is not absolute, but always relative to your current scenario, to your current to, to my data collection yeah. capabilities, really. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I think, I, I think. Okay, here. No, he, he didn't, he explicitly yeah, yeah, said I mean, here, it's not here, fixed. Yeah. That's why. It's... Yeah, and so here we implicitly always made this assumption because also we didn't want to make it too complicated that uh, the feature space is fixed yeah so the only source of uh, additional information is more data but this can be generalized this is what i wanted to say 
this can be generalized if you are in a setting where you could add additional features, for instance. Yeah, the, the, because precisely because you said that with the features, that's why I yeah. got on that horse in a way. Yeah. Um, and but I mean, but I, then I, I, if I would you, if you would have phrased it differently, like say not, instead of aleatoric, I would say something like capabilities, something yeah. something data collection. I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> This so, is where the confusion so, came from. So, uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. From those terminologies I mean, and those the, yeah. the soft definitions, not so much the hard mathematical explanation. That's yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so I know. Uh, I I also I, I had some discussions with philosophers already exactly. about the topic, uh, and yeah, as I said, it's an interesting discussion. We are a little bit more pragmatic, and uh, our notions of aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty are really depending on the context, depending on the situation, and very much refer to this idea of what can I reduce potentially and what I can't get rid of, the, the remaining uncertainty I cannot get rid of, even if I collect all the information I could potentially collect, could potentially collect. Yeah. Other questions? disappear isn't maybe a little more strict than is maybe necessary to get useful solutions i mean if, if you look at the the open property list here like model uncertainty general settings these are all settings which are very relevant for practical applications right so if i now imagine i'm learning an algorithm which is able to give me an estimate for of the epistemic uncertainty i probably don't want the algorithm to learn that it's always zero because it has seen an infinitely large training data set but i would be actually very happy about a useful measure of epistemic uncertainty to maybe help me with su such settings here so i was wondering maybe you know maybe i don't have a second order loss which really learns the direct function when I'm completely reducing the epistemic uncertainty, but maybe it's enough to somehow have a loss, which allows me that if I find a small value of the loss that I'm somewhere in the neighborhood of where I want to be, and actually I already I learned something very useful. Yeah. So maybe some relaxation like this can help to formulate such losses and is, you know, give some hope to, uh, that it is possible to learn such second order uh, models. Yeah, I, I wouldn't uh, definitely disagree. So I would agree. Basically, I would agree. And um, these uh, theoretical results that we have uh, shown, they, of course, do not exclude that these things are nevertheless of some practical use. And uh, these empirical results that have been shown in the paper actually confirm this. Uh, we just want to make the point that from a theoretical perspective, you should be a little bit cautious plus um, you um, should really acknowledge that a large amount of the uncertainty that is eventually um, contained in the prediction comes from this regularization term, which in a sense is relatively arbitrary. So the predictions are definitely not as objective as they might be claimed to be. That, that's what we wanted to show. Theoretically, but practically, I don't deny that they are, might be nevertheless useful. Yeah. <clears throat> and and um, and uh, the, this is also, I think, what you said. I, I didn't get everything acoustically, but um, even if you bias all your predictions toward the uniform, you could still keep a good order of the predictions uh, in terms of uh, uncertainty. I mean, you could still this could still allow you to say this predictor is more uncertain than that one. So the, the, such a relative notion of epistemic uncertainty might still be preserved, even with uh, such an approach, even if you cannot interpret. Uh, yeah, Willem wants to stop. Uh, <laughs> so I think that one. Yeah, yeah, but the workshops only start at two. Uh, we also have a workshop. But okay, uh, we can also, anyway, we meet uh, probably offline uh, again and uh, then can continue this discussion. But basically, yeah, I, I do agree with what you said.
Okay, so thank you for having been here.